Good morning. May I ask everybody to find a seat and, uh, I mean, feel free to come closer. Um, it's always nicer when there's a little bit of sort of closeness in the debate. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Finn Tarp, and I'm the uh, director of Union Wider. I've been asked by the IEA to chair this session, a task I've been looking forward to very much. The theme of this IEA plenary is indeed very close to my heart um, and also to the focus and tradition of much of what the participants in this conference are actually working on in their daily lives. What can really be more important than doing and teaching economics for the real world and ask the truly big questions about development, policy and development strategy? Today's speaker, Professor Danny Rodwick, will be known to all of you. Danny is the Ford Foundation Professor of International Political Economy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. And as you will have seen from the program, Danny will take over as president of the IEA in 2020. His last exciting book is entitled Straight Talk on Trade, Ideas for a Sane World Economy. And I for sure look forward to Danny's straight talk on today's theme. Our discussant is Eric Berloff, professor in the Department of Economics at the LSC and director of the Institute of Global Affairs. Previously, Eric was chief economist and special advisor to the president of the EBRD. And he has also been a director of the Stockholm Institute of Transition Economics and professor at the Stockholm School of Economics. In 2013, he was awarded the Antwerp Medal and finally, and also very importantly, he is the treasury, treasurer of the IEA. So we are in extremely competent hands at this IEA plenary and I would like to invite Daniel to take the floor for his presentation, which will then be followed uh, by Eric's uh, discussion comments and then we will have some time for uh, questions and answers uh, before we have uh, to close. Welcome, everybody. Danny. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Finn. It, it's, really, um, it's really a great uh, uh, um, honor and pleasure to be here uh, at, the, um, at the World Congress of the IEA. Um, I, w I want to thank um, uh, everybody who, who made this possible. Um, uh, Kaushik Basu and Tim Besley for organizing all of this for, uh, and for the, uh, the invitation for me to, to address uh, this, this plenary. Um, I've been watching what they do very closely since at some point I'll be able to, um, that they'll be the model that I will have to, I will have to follow. Um, the, the topic for uh, uh, my presentation uh, today is a little bit of a, of a side interest for me. This is not um, economic methodology or the uh, or the, the philosophy of science uh, is, is not really um, my field, but it's something I've been interested in because I've, most of my career I've been in, in um, interdisciplinary environments. And in some ways, uh, it's always um, uh, have been at, the, at, you know, at points where it's been partly uh, explaining, partly uh, apologizing for economics. Um, the explaining because I think there is a lot of misunderstanding um, in the other social sciences about how economics works. Um, and apologizing because um, uh, we're not always the best um, advocates for our cause. And I think um, I will explain a little bit what I mean by that. Um, and and uh, I, I think, it, it, you know, it, it, when I spent uh, two years uh, at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, uh, which is you know, as interdisciplinary as it gets, I was the only economist essentially surrounded by uh, cultural anthropologists and, 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 and sociologists. Uh, the urge uh, to uh, sort of do something that would, uh, at least to my own mind, uh, explain to me what is it that we do uh, um, as economists uh, in a way that uh, would reach both economists and, and as well as non-economists sort of reach its height. And, and I, I wrote a little book uh, on which I'm going to be drawing uh, in, my, in my presentation uh, today. Um, the title is a little bit, uh, I think at least, I, I hope that half of the title is really redundant. So when we say doing and teaching economics 
for the real world, uh, I don't know now why I added for the real world, right? I mean, it should be doing and teaching economics, period. I don't know of any economics that we want to do that's not for the real world. Um, and I think, uh, but that's, um, uh, but that, this is very much a kind of an applied uh, kind, kind of a talk. So, amongst us, um, but this is uh, just the last few years, um, the, the winners uh, of the Nobel Prize in, in, in economics. Uh, the, um, and and, uh, and the, the, I think what there, there's a, um, we learn a lot by uh, the reception that the Nobelists get uh, in the media and the public when these prizes are announced. Um, and uh, the question always is that they are asked, what's the big idea? What is it that you did? What is it that, you know, that, you know, what is it that they did? Uh, that, that deserved uh, this, this, this big prize. Um, now often, uh, I think, and this is certainly true um, of, of most of the, 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 the awards in the last few years, most of the time there's really actually not a big idea. Uh, it, it is not to say that this is the, what they do is extremely important, but what they do is ex ex exactly what I'm going to argue uh, economics is, which is sort of developing collections of models. So if you look at sort of the last prize, uh, Bank Holmstrom and, and, um, and Oliver Hart, really a collection of models on, on contract theory um, and agency. Going back, Jean Tirol, of course, collection of models on regulation. Uh, Angus Deaton, um, uh, really sort of very uh, contextual, applied, empirical work um, that he would be the first one to say, really, uh, one should not generalize outside the particular context. I remember uh, when uh, uh, Jean Tirot won his prize, um, sort of being in, he was interviewed by the, uh, the New York Times, and, and, and uh, a New York Times reporter kept asking him, so, so what is it that you found? What's the big idea? You know, what's the conclusion of your research? And a very frustrated uh, Jean Tirot sort of having to say, look, you know, it all varies. You know, the way that you would regulate a credit card company is very different from the way that you'd regulate public utilities. Um, and, and, and so what I've tried to do is develop models that are going to be applied to these different kinds of settings. So, you know, don't trivialize it by, uh, these are my words, he didn't say that it was much more polite by trying to sort of, you know, draw a very sort of broad uh, and therefore misleading conclusion. Um, if we go a little bit further, uh, we have an interesting prize that um, actually, um, these are two of the three prize winners that year, uh, Fama and, and, and Schiller. And the big, big debate, you know, the, the, the big discussion then was the question, well, hold on, Fama stands for um, uh, uh, efficient markets, uh, Schiller stands for excess volatility and inefficient markets. Uh, how can they both possibly be right? What what is the Nobel Prize Committee actually thinking? But in a way, I think the way that I interpret that particular prize was actually that, well, sometimes markets are better modeled as working efficiently. Sometimes they're better modeled as exhibiting excess volatility. And sometimes it's farmers, that's who's right. Sometimes it's Schiller. I think both gave us models and tools which were extremely important uh, in terms of, of uh, understanding the world. So. Um, uh, the, the, um, as usual, um, this was best put, uh, best expressed by John Maynard Keynes. Now, I did not know this quote from Keynes when I wrote my book, and I probably, I may not have written my book uh, if I had known of this quote, because in some ways, uh, this is a quote this is, uh, that explains, explains exactly what I was trying to say, uh, that economics is a science of thinking in terms of models joined to the art of uh, choosing models which are relevant. Okay? Um, very straightforward, and I think this is exactly how our profession works, how it, 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 it progresses. Now, um, this, uh, this way of thinking about models as being central to the profession actually has you know, quite a bit of history. And it, you know, it, it goes back, you know, that way back in the 1970s, uh, there's a great piece, which I'm, I'm sure many of you know, by Axel uh, Leonhofut, um, who's a, who was a macroeconomist, but sort of a, a critique of, 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 of macroeconomics, where he, he wrote sort of a mock uh, cultural anthropology on the tribe of economics, the way that the discipline worked, and he called it sort of the tribe of the econ, and the, and the, um, and the article was called Life Among the Econ, and, and he emphasized in this, in, in this article sort of how central 
models, which he called sort of models, uh, were, were to, the, um, uh, to the practice of economics. It says, the status of the adult male, well, um, this is the 70s, is determined by his skill at making the model of his field. Um, so that that's really, that's, that's really what you know, earns you your, your stripes, are, 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 are the models. Um, and that's because we have models, and m many other social scientists don't, this allows us to look down on, on what the others do. So, for example, in explaining to a stranger, for example, why he, a member of the econ tribe, holds the sociogs or the policies in such low regard, the econ will say they do not make models and leave it at that. Now, of course, um, it, it, this has changed a lot from the 1970s. Political science and sociology uh, has, has become much, parts of them have become much more model oriented. The other thing that, that um, uh, Leon Hufford emphasized, although he was a critic of this, uh, back then was that in fact there was no agreement on models, that there were multiple models. Um, and speaking about macro, his own discipline in particular, he emphasized that, or the, the, or the distinction between the micro and the macro, uh, so he, he talked about the sort of that there is no intermarriage uh, between those who, um, the castes, between the castes that emphasize the micro model, that, that worship the micro model versus the castes that, that uh, worship the, the macro model. Um, um, so this, I, I will argue, this, this multiplicity of models, um, I think is actually uh, a, 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 um, uh, uh, it's, it's a, it's a positive side of, it's, it's, um, of, of economics. And I think one of the things that I'm going to argue against is the view uh, that is particularly current, I think, in macroeconomics, uh, but often also in some other branches in the field, which is that, that really what we ought to be striving at is towards identifying, finding the correct model, uh, that, you know, that we are striving toward the model. And I'm going to argue that this is the wrong way about, of thinking about economics, that, we, you know, that, that uh, it's really, um, as Keynes in fact said, economics is a science of a multiplicity of models, uh, each one of them uh, that might be applicable in different kinds of settings. But why focus on models? Why is it that models are so important? Uh, there's, there's no better piece I know that explains uh, the virtue of abstraction and simplicity that really models are, then a, uh, a fascinating piece by uh, Borges uh, that um, is really, um, it's, a, it's a short story, and the whole short story is actually on this slide. So it, it, it's going to take me longer to explain it, to tell you that I, then it would actually take you to read it. But basically the story is about um, a, um, a far distant land back in history um, where the cartographers, the map make makers, developed this obsession with accuracy. Um, and therefore, they wanted to make maps that were as accurate as possible. Um, and uh, so, in their quest, they ended up making uh, maps of a city that were, maps of a province that were as large as the city itself. A map of the empire was as large as, a, as, as the province. And then they wouldn't stop at that. Eventually, they tried to do a one-to-one -one map, which is to make a map of the empire that was as large as the empire itself. And, and, and then uh, uh, and the story ends by saying how uh, generations later, uh, down the road, uh, the, ru the, maps, the ruins of this map were fine scattered uh, in, the, in the sands because uh, you know, they had absolutely no use. Uh, no one could, could, could actually use it. So the, the, the analogy of maps is here, here really useful because when I, when I explain sort of the, the usefulness of sort of models, uh, I, I use the map analogy and say, suppose you're walking out of, of, your, of, your, of your apartment and, um, and you're getting somewhere and you need a map. Uh, the map that you would take with you uh, uh, would um, uh, depend on whether you're traveling by subway, or you're walking, you're taking a car, or uh, you're riding by bike. Uh, depending on, on which way, what you're going to be using, the mode of transport, the, the map that you're going to be taking with you is going to be very different. And each one of these maps is actually going to be inaccurate. And that's not a bug, that's a feature, uh, because it's just going to be highlighting exactly what it is that, 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 that you want to be, uh, um, that you, know, you want to focus on for that. So, um, let, me, let, me, let me lay out the, the broad argument. I think most of the pieces I've put on the, on, uh, on the table already. So, uh, I want to say that models are actually the essence 
of the science of economics. They are key to the scientific nature of, of economics. And what they do is they help us understand the complex social reality uh, by laying bare a very large variety of causal relationships one at a time. Okay? That's the simplicity and the abstraction. Now, the second thing I want to convince you of is that actually, in, not in our practice, but in the way that we explain our practice uh, to our peers and our students, we actually have a wrong take on our discipline. We have internalized the wrong philosophy of science. Uh, that the way that we typically explain it is some kind of a 19th century you know, physics notion uh, that you know, we uh, develop with models and theories, we test them, refine them, and then eventually we get to a better one. Um, I don't think, in fact, uh, this is how it works. Uh, that economics advances not by settling on the model, uh, but by generating a library uh, of a useful collection of models, each one of which uh, is a, a partial uh, an explanation. Okay? Um, and I think that if you, we were to internalize this notion of economics, um, that it would actually provide a very powerful counter-argument to many of the critiques of economics from non-economists. Um, uh, you know, if I have time, I'll, I'll get to that uh, at the end. Um, um, uh, now, the, 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 the part where we fail as a discipline um, is, I think, if you take this description of, of what is it that we do, the part that we fail and we fail rather badly at uh, is actually in teaching our students or, in fact, uh, ourselves thinking systematically and rigor rigorously uh, about how we are going to be, in fact, choosing the right model. How are we going to be navigating among them? In the back of our mind, we have this sort of notion that econometrics or randomization or, or some perfect statistical technique would allow us to choose the right model, but for a variety of reasons that I'm, I'm going to be uh, getting into, that doesn't actually work. Um, and moreover, most of the time, what we have to do is actually select the right model in, a, um, in, a, uh, in, in real time when you don't have the benefit of being able to do an RCT or find the perfect natural experiment. Um, and we need tools uh, to work on what Keynes called the art and what I call actually the craft in my book uh, on navigating among different models in real time. I'll give you a bit of an example from my own work um, uh, as I go on. Okay. Um, so, uh, let's, I mean, uh, stressing the importance of, of multiplicity of models. Um, Think of some of the, the most um, significant questions, the most important questions in economics. Uh, what's the effect of minimum wages on employment? How does competition affect innovation? What's the ex effect of expansion or fiscal policy on economic activity? How does capital inflows affect economic growth? What's the effect of trade liberalization on economic performance? And you can go on and on and on and on. And what's the answer to each one of these questions? The answer uh, that we have different models that produce uh, different results. Um, none of them. There is not a single answer uh, to each one of these uh, questions. Um, the example that you know, I'll spend maybe one minute on is the example of minimum wages. Uh, so what are the employment consequences of minimum wages imposed by a government? Typically in the classroom, this is the model that we're going to teach. It's the perfectly competitive model where there's a labor demand, there is labor supply. Equilibrium is when those two intersect. The government comes in, uh, raises uh, the, the wage, imposes a, a floor. Uh, what that's going to do is it's going to reduce employment. So that's the competitive model. But of course, we know uh, that this is not uh, um, the only possible model. Uh, if um, if um, employers have uh, at least local monopsony power, that is that they have some control uh, over the wage that they can uh, uh, pay, uh, then in fact the equilibrium we observe is not the intersection of supply and demand, it's the, it's the, it's the intersection of the marginal of the supply curve with the demand curve. Um, and that uh, gives us a very different equilibrium. What happens now when we put a minimum wage, as long as the minimum wage is not too high, in fact, uh, we've turned the monopsonistic employer uh, into a perfectly competitive uh, employer, and therefore employment actually expands. A theoretical curiosum? No, because this is one way of making sense of why so many empirical studies on the effect of minimum wages find either no results or actually increases in employment 
Uh, and one possible explanation is that you know, employers do in fact have local monopsony power for a variety of reasons that, that actually um, um, have been laid out in, in the literature. Um, so I'll, mention, I'll talk a little bit about teaching also later on, but here is one sort of advantage of, of, of these multiplicity of models and, and how we can use it in teaching is not, is not focusing too much necessarily on just one benchmark model uh, when there are alternative models. And the critical thing, of course, is going to be to focus on what is the behavioral mechanisms in each one of these models, because understanding those behavioral mechanisms is both important and it's also a way of empirically distinguishing uh, uh, both ex after the fact and also in real time, which of these two models is the, might be more, more applicable. Now, when I say that, that the multiplicity of models, uh, the centrality of models are key also, uh, to, to economics, um, sometimes I get the response to say, well, you know, that maybe when statistical and empirical techniques were not sufficiently developed, uh, that, you know, our focus on models was appropriate. But now, you know, we can do empirical analysis, plus we have uh, big data, um, and we don't, we, we don't need that much theorizing anymore. We can uh, simply look at the patterns in the data. We can let the facts speak for themselves. Do an RCT, um, let the facts speak for themselves. Um, I think this is very wrong. I think this is a very misleading um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, approach. Uh, the fact is that facts do not speak for themselves. Every fact uh, requires an interpretive frame. Uh, the more explicit, uh, the better. Um, and in fact, even when we don't think we're using an interpretive frame, uh, we are doing it, and it's much better to do it explicitly, that is by way of models, uh, than to doing it implicitly. Um, uh, you know, I got a, a, a very good example of what I mean in, 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 in the least likely of places on Twitter, uh, when somebody gave me an example of precisely uh, of, 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 of this point, which is to say that, you know, look at one of the cleanest facts you can imagine. Imagine you're, t you're tossing a series of coins, or you know, you have a you know, series of coin tosses, and after 10 uh, of coin tosses, you have nine of them have come up heads. Okay? As uh, clean a fact as you can find. So the issue is, what do you make of this? What does this mean? In the absence of a basic probability model uh, that this is a random toss, that the, 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 the tosses are independent, that this is a fair coin. In the absence of a particular model, uh, that those facts are meaningless. They don't tell you anything at all. And I think um, uh, the issue of, of um, um, a sort of that, uh, of regularities, correlations in the data, um, that, that big data, for example, are very good at, uh, the problem is in the absence of a particular model, you don't know when those regularities or correlations might break down. Because after all, the model tells you what the causal story is, what the behavioral story is, and therefore prepares you uh, for when uh, those might break down uh, in, in environments that are never really going to be stable. So you can't get away with these models and frames, and that's... Um, now you can think of these models as these, the stories that we tell ourselves as fables, um, and that makes it, uh, that makes economics you know, sort of more like literature. Uh, you know, it's not, there's nothing wrong about it. But you can also think of models as, as experiments. Uh, that are, they are, you know, when we say a thought experiment, uh, the experiment is actually is an experiment. And there is a clear parallel uh, between a lab experiment and a model as a thought experiment because they do very much the same things, which is as a lab experiment uh, uh, sort of um, uh, tries to isolate um, the effect that is being studied. Um, the effect of specific causes or intervention, and economic models tries tar to clarify a particular causal link uh, by abstracting from others. Okay? Just like a lab experiment can be replicated, right? uh, a model can be replicated. Once you have set it out, uh, it, then it's, it's possible for others uh, to, uh, to uh, check, your, check your logic and your, your, your algebra. So in that way, uh, actually, models are experiments, and in that way, they are scientific. But let me be a little bit more uh, clear about what I mean by models being scientific. Um, so I think, obviously, um, one respect in which models are scientific uh, is, um, is that uh, they clarify the nature of the hypothesis. They very 
uh, clear about what the causal chains are. Um, so that's the virtue of abstraction and isolation. Um, and um, now this might seem to you, of course, uh, but you know, I, I assure you, if you spend enough time in, in, the, in the broader world of the social sciences, uh, sort of the clarity uh, of, of uh, the hypotheses that you get uh, in, in economics, I think, is a, is a true virtue uh, that is not replicated in, in uh, everywhere, necessarily in the social sciences. Uh, the second thing which it helps is in terms of it helps in model selection, in terms of which framework are we going to apply uh, to the problem at hand. Um, it, 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 it helps that because once you have the critical assumptions at work, once you have the behavioral uh, uh, relationships, it provides a way of selecting which of the models uh, might be more relevant. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, third, very importantly, uh, and it's again a feature that many other social sciences lack, uh, it, it provides a method for sorting out uh, disagreements There's a, that you and I may not agree, but we actually will know what is it that we're not agreeing on. Um, and, and, and this is a tremendous virtue. Um, and and there's, a, there's a great quote from the chemist uh, Wolfgang Pauli, um, who, you know, who used to sort of, you know, uh, put down the work uh, of, of um, you know, some of his junior colleagues um, at, and by saying, this argument is not even wrong. What does that mean? It means that you know, it's, it hasn't even been stated sufficiently clearly that we could actually know uh, whether it's wrong or right. And, and um, uh, um, uh, economics, with its, because of sort of its focus on models and clarity, um, I think avoids that. And finally, the accumulation of, of, of knowledge um, is um, the, uh, the idea that, um, that we, we actually learn about the world uh, through a richer set of models. So just to take the simplest example, you know, we start with the model of the invis invisible hand, the perfectly competitive model. Uh, then that tells us how mod a particular type of competition works. Then we have another model, which is a monopoly model. We have another one that's an oligopoly. Within oligopoly, we have very different models. Each one of those is telling us something about how particular contexts of competition turn out. Uh, then we have models of um, uh, asymmetric information when we sort of have, you know, say, you know, you know here, there are some markets when consumers do not know uh, the nature of the good that they're buying. So that, that makes it even richer. So we can apply uh, the competition model in, model in, 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 in context of incomplete and asymmetric information. Now, the fact that we have a, you know, uh, you know the mar models with asymmetric information or models of duopoly doesn't mean that the competitive model has been displaced. It doesn't mean that sort of the new model doesn't get rid of the old one. Uh, it just provides us with uh, um, richer understanding of, of additional set of contexts that the earlier model may not have uh, been appropriate with. Um, so models are, are, are often associated with math, um, and uh, I think this is, you know, clarity obviously, you know, sort of, it, it's because, uh, you know, that the math helps us clarify uh, the nature of assumptions and, re, re, you know, relationship conclusions. Uh, but, you know, I tell my students that, you know, e economists use math not because they're smart, uh, but they, they, but they rec because they recognize they're not smart enough. Uh, that is that, you know, it's, what it, math really does, it just makes sure that your conclusions fall off from your assumptions. That's all there is. Um, and if you are smart enough that to be sure of that, and, and everybody could recognize that, you could simply dispense uh, with the math. Um, importance of maintained assumptions. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to that maybe later. Let me just pass it. So um, what I said uh, at the outset that, that you know, we're very good at generating models. We're very bad at navigating among them. Uh, and I think this is where we fail, both as teachers as, and in, in our role as, as policy uh, in, in the public world. Now, how do we um, perform this craft of economics, of, of navigating the world of models? Um, I, I talk in my book about sort of different strategies um, and they are sort of cl can be classified under four different headings. One, of course, is to verify direct implications. This is essentially what ex post empirical testing does. Uh, but often uh, we do not have uh, access to the perfect you know, um, uh, test or perfect natural experiment, but we can use others, we can do other things. We can verify the incidental implications of the model. Uh, 
uh, that is, you know, the comparative statics of a model provide uh, a rich set of, of uh, hypotheses to be tested that go beyond the specific example that we might be in interested. For example, in my example of the minimum wage, uh, um, sort of the, uh, the, the assumption that, the, that the, the, the monopsonistic model has implications not only for um, uh, what, how the firms are going to react, how the market is going to react to a minimum wage, but it also has implications, for example, how uh, monopsonistic firms are going to pass on uh, the cost increases onto their prices, which are going to be different than in the, in the perfectly competitive model. So that's an incidental implication that provides another dimension for possible uh, informal testing. Um, verifying the critical assumptions. Now, I do underline um, critical because um, I want to uh, somewhat disagree with Milton Friedman's point that assumptions not matter. Of course, certain assumptions matter, and the assumptions that matter are, in fact, those that are critical, uh, so that, that uh, the critical assumptions are those that would actually reverse uh, the result uh, if you move them uh, in a direction that made them empirically more, more valid. Uh, so those critical assumptions are extremely important, and we can um, verify those criti critical assumptions. For example, again, in the case of the monopsonistic uh, uh, firm, a uh, critical assumption is that, you know, there is local competition is, 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 is inadequate, so that's, uh, uh, that's, or that there is not enough entry and so forth. That those are things that, that can be informally tested. And finally, verifying the mechanisms, because each one of these models actually tell you uh, why is it that uh, the reaction of the market is being, going to be in the same way? So we can actually look whether there is evidence uh, that firms or, or households or investors are behaving in the way uh, that uh, the models tell us. Okay? Um, now, in, in, in my own work on, on economic growth, essentially this is uh, in some ways uh, you know, what I've tried to do. So if you, if you look at, take this into the world of development economics or growth economics, uh, really all real world questions about growth economics is really uh, is, you know, seeking an answer uh, to uh, these, the question as to which model should we be applying. Should we apply the neoclassical uh, solo model? Should we apply an endogenous growth model where R&D and competition are the key things? A model of trade and growth, uh, the dual economy model, a structuralist econo economy model where there are structural differences in labor productivity, the quote-unquote Chicago model, where it's essentially everything, markets would be fine, uh, but it's the governments that are really screwing everything up. Um, the institutionalist model, where it's really all about contract enforcement, property rights. So the, the search for what countries ought to be doing, what kind of growth strategy they would be following, is really a search for figuring out which one of these is the more relevant model to apply. Um, so the craft, therefore, of doing growth economics for the real world uh, is to essentially look for uh, how we can discriminate uh, among these models in a particular setting because none of them is going to be the correct one for all countries for all times. And the way we do that um, is, is uh, in my own work and, and, and joint work with um, Andres Velasco and, and, um, uh, and Ricardo Hausmann. So we've developed a number of informal ways uh, you can do that by looking, for example, for you know, diagnostic si signals. So if a particular model is correct, uh, there must be uh, certain features of the way that this economy behaves. Uh, so for example, an economy that is constrained by poor property rights and where therefore investment is low because investment demand is low, is going to, be behave is going to respond very differently to uh, tra transfer of savings or remittances from, a from abroad or an exogenous increase in capital flows than a country where, in fact, investment is constrained, not on the demand side, but on the supply side, by inadequate domestic savings. In the second case, uh, you will have a b large behavioral response to uh, increase in remittances or capital flows. In the first case, not necessarily. Um, and so on. So, uh, you know, so this can be done, uh, but the, the, the problem is that we actually do not think systematically about this, and because we do not think systematically about it, we actually do not teach our students how to do this. Um, and, uh, and even though I think the best economists in practice are informally doing this, they're informally selecting a particular model to apply, but they're rarely explicit about how they've gone about selecting one model as opposed to another. Um, so uh, what does this all mean for teaching economics? First of all, 
let's just cherish the diversity of models. The multiplicity of models is not an embarrassment. Uh, it's, the, it's, it's, a, it's a strength. We have to emphasize the plurality of critical assumptions. Uh, teach multiple models side by side, as in my sort of, you know, the, the minimum wage example. Uh, we need to go emphasize logics beyond the competitive market equilibrium. Second best thinking is extremely important. Uh, uh, coordination failures, uh, small numbers interactions, using more game theory. All of them generate results, a, a wealth of diverse results that's very different from the competitive benchmark, uh, which I think is very important in terms of, of driving, uh, sort of, of, of giving students, equipping them with tools for, for analyzing alternative settings. Um, and uh, most important, uh, emphasizing economics as a way of thinking without embarrassment rather than as a defense or argument for free markets and, and efficiency. Okay, that's, um, so I would argue, and I, I'm just going to, um, to, uh, to end here, um, uh, I would argue that if you think about economics the way um, that um, I have been presenting it, which is that, that uh, it, it's really, it's all about models, it's not about the model, but I think we would actually have uh, a, a good answer to many of the criticisms. Uh, that, that we encounter from, from non-economists. Um, however, uh, it doesn't really absolve us um, uh, uh, from, from our, our many failures. I think big failure, of course, is what we always do, is, is mistaking a model for the model. And that is, I think, it's, it's where we often go wrong uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in the real world. I think we're wrong to always have a categorical preference for certain axioms. Of course, um, we have preference for questions that are amenable to available tools rather than the ones that might be more important. And, and uh, a, a sort of a proclivity for what I call implicit political economy theorizing in policy discussions. Uh, let's not give the policymakers this particular model because it's going to be hijacked by the barbarians. Okay? Uh, so that way of thinking, uh, which I think has, gone, has, has, um, has gotten us wrong. So let me end. Um, by saying that I think recognizing that economics is really a, is a portfolio of models I think would force us uh, to be more humble uh, about how much we, would, we really know um, I think would enable greater understanding of a variety of social phenomena and I think would also um, serve to close some of the gaps that we have with other social sciences because we would say if you don't think our model is right tell us what your model is and let's see if we can make sense of it, and then let's discuss what are the conditions under which your model works under conditions that this other works. In fact, ec economists have been pretty good about that. That's what economic imperialism in the discipline is really about, is, is absorbing some of the causal explanations in, in others. Um, and, and I think that's great. Uh, again, where we ought to be doing a lot better at uh, by, is by, once we are explicit that it's really about the multiple of models, the next step to be much more clear-sighted, much more rigorous, much more upfront about the need that we need to develop this craft or the art, as Keynes called it, of being able to pick the model for the content. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for um, asking me to uh, discuss this paper or presentation. So do we have a, my slides? Wonderful. So I am, um, so Danny sent me this presentation and he took out uh, this slide. He, I guess he didn't want to promote his book too much, but I, I'm happy to, to, to uh, promote it, and I think it is a, a very important book, and I'm already using it uh, in my teaching. So, so um, what I was a bit worried about when I started reading this presentation that, that Danny just gave was that um, you know, he had these pictures of, of um, some of the icons in, in economics, and particularly for me, you know, if you read it, what's the big idea? So, I, you know, so this is now going to be an attack on, on Ben Thompson and Oliver Hart, who were sort of the, my thesis was really built on their models, and, and um, Jean Tirole probably gave the force that changed my thinking about economics most profoundly, and if there's anyone who has influenced my thinking around economics in the last 10 years, it's Angus Deaton. So, but 
I think I now understand why he had those names, and I think they are good illustrations of what, what uh, economics is about today. So, so um, it is difficult to discuss a book and a presentation where you are so, so generally uh, sympathetic to, to the, the basic message. And, and I think what comes out very nicely uh, also in the presentation is this sort of basic humility uh, 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 towards the task of, of um, trying to understand this very complex world and where we are using models. So I, you know, if Dan is not a uh, philosopher of science, you know, I'm certainly uh, not one either, I will try to use the two experiences I've had and, and, and see you know, what, to what extent can they help us uh, sort of shed light on the issues that Danny brought up. So I had uh, a decade almost in, in policy making and, and um, you know, it, it gave me a lot of opportunities to reflect on you know, what, what, what can economics achieve. And uh, you know, the first thing that hits you, I was in this international financial institution, is that you know, what they expect from economists are forecasts and you know, kind of proved causality. And, and the things that probably are the hardest things, and I, I personally hate forecasting, but I was forced to do it all the time. But um, you know, I think where economists can really contribute is to show how things um, are connected and, and making sense of a very complex uh, relationships, and th this is, of course, where, where models comes in. And um, I think it's economics, economics can also help us, uh, and I think is in these organizations it's actually a crucial thing to have you know, systematic implementation and learning. So the way we implement projects, we do it in a way that allows us to use sort of scientific criteria. Not every project, of course, can be made into a, a randomized control trial, but there are ways in which you roll out programs in the way in, in which you uh, distribute information about uh, a particular program, a particular project, uh, that we can use to learn more and, and, and in that way become more effective. The other experience I wanted to draw on is, is that I'm now building an interdisciplinary institute and, and I had the pleasure also of spending uh, a year at the, the, the Princeton of the, of the West Coast at the Stanford uh, Center for Advanced Studies in Behavioral Sciences. And it was a wonderful world to be in, for, at least for, for, for a while. And I'm very much back in that world now because I, I'm having to deal with the kind of intimidation that other disciplines feel that economics uh, somehow impose on them. Or, or that you know, the, we are scary in the way that we uh, command math and statistics and, and the way that we construct models that are maybe more explicit and, and more, more uh, transparent in a way. Uh, but the, the other thing that, and then of course Danny came to that at, at the end, you know, what we have to recognize, and, and, and I think we sometimes forgot in the past, and I think we are much better at it now, that, you know, economists cannot explain everything. You know, you know, knowing economists who work on migration, for example, will say that, you know, we can explain, we have all the explanations for why uh, migration happens in a particular way and why it's resistant for, for, uh, for what reasons and so on. So, you know, I think it gives us, uh, to work in these interdisciplinary environments gives us a, a fundamental humility, but also ideas for, for how to think about things differently. So, so um, I, I like this uh, paper. I had seen it, but I actually hadn't re read it until uh, I prepared this presentation. So. so Clearly, we sort of all recognize ourselves to some extent in this sort of the world of, of econ and, and, you know, where models rule. But I actually think this was written in the early 70s. I think economics is actually quite different, and, and, and Dan is a, is, is a wonderful illustration of, of that. You know, we have many more models today. I think we are, you know, we may even have a risk of overpopulation of models, but, but uh, certainly that, I think, it was a different world from, from the one when Axel Leir wrote his piece. And I think the role of data and empirical research is much more important today. Maybe almost to a fault, but it's, it's certainly a very different uh, world uh, from then. And, um, you know, we, and, and yeah, so I think, so I think we, you know, when I spend time in these kind of interdisciplinary environments, I'm, I'm impressed that, for example, anthropology, which we probably often think of as very far away from, from what economists do, and, and this article is, is sort of an anthropology of, of economics. 
uh, actually the, the kind of attention to data, understanding data, uh, and, and being careful about the collection of data, at least from the anthropologists that I interact with, uh, is, are sort of very encouraging. I wouldn't have expected to have that strong um, sort of affinity to, to how they think about these issues. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop now. So, 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 of course, you know, I'm going to repeat a few things here, but I, hopefully I can, I can say something with a slightly different twist. So, so clearly, models are better, you know, they are, allow us to, to think better. And, you know, Danny was saying that, uh, you know, it's not because we think we, we are smarter, but it's because we understand that we are actually stupid, so we need models to try to unpack um, uh, relationships and, and of course it's as much as trying to understand new relationships as undoing sort of connections that we have made sort of immediately with this sort of urge that we have as humans to, to, to create patterns when we, where there are no patterns and I think that's where, where models are really powerful sort of to combat that sense of, of, of making um, inferences and, 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 and drawing conclusions when when we really cannot or should not do it. And that, you know, technologies are a, a way to think fresh and, and keep thinking about core issues. So in a sense, and I think again, that's the spirit in which I, I, I read um, Danis Marx, is that you know, we, are, you know, we are looking at the same issues essentially as, as Adam Smith, but we, you know, we are taking new models to the question. And, and to some extent this is of course, we want to see a new aspects, and we think that maybe this will allow us to understand certain things better. But it's also, frankly, a way to keep alive the quest uh, for knowledge in economics. And here I think of, of the humanities, where you know, we can make fun of a lot of the theorizing that goes on in, in humanities and so on. But without that, it would be very hard, I think, to, to sort of sustain, or tra have that transition of, or, or that um, tradition of of a transfer of knowledge across generations. This, this theorizing about issues allows you to transfer knowledge from one generation to another. I think that's part of the, the role of models in, in economics. Uh, and I think one thing that has happened certainly since the, the time that Axel Levin, who wrote his piece in the early 70s, that we, we are much better of writing models to, that can generate certain results. And that's clearly a, an issue. I mean, if we, you know, I. I you know, maybe I couldn't, but, but certainly a lot of people that I work with could generate re basically any result that, that you want. And, and I think that's where we have to be careful, and that's where the selection of models uh, become very important. And of course, it's very easy, so once we have come up with a model, to become prisoners of that model. So we need kind of checks on, 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 on the models uh, exposed. So, so so we have this multitude of models, and again, I think it's fundamentally healthy. It gives you a sense of humility, but also a sense of wonder how, how incredibly complex uh, reality is. And it gives us you know, the greater awareness of the contextual nature of models. By the fact that we see different models, suddenly we see that maybe in, in different environments, different things matter. So, so this is uh, very happy. I, I, and I like very much the models as fables uh, and experiments. It's, it's a very useful way of thinking uh, about economics and also a very useful way of, of teaching. And it makes us sort of less literal in our understanding. And here, of course, the Borges uh, sort of allegory is, is, is wonderful because it's, you know, we're not trying to document on a one-to-one -one, uh, basis. We're trying to shed lights on, 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 on relationships. And, so. and, and you know, models are experiments and experiments are models. And that's very much uh, how, how I think about it too. Models are, are really important, I think, and it goes back to what I said before, in how we accumulate knowledge. So, you know, how do we, in what sense do we kind of build on it? And I think here we have an advantage over some of the other social sciences that, that we, we, it's maybe easier to, to remember to structure that knowledge uh, when you use models and you can sort of maybe more quickly understand, you know, what is the specifics of, of a, a particular model and why, is it, why is, does it generate different stuff. We need a portfolio of models because we want to understand, you know, a, a wide variety of social phenomena and as Danny was saying, I think we are helping to close uh, the gaps uh, to other social sciences. And I think we are less imperialistic today than we maybe were in, in the past when we have, but 
it's ex exactly in, in the sort of interfaces with other social sciences that a lot of the interesting ideas are from. So how should we select among models? So selection of models have become much more complicated because we have many more of them. And, and you know, ex post, we have, you know, we, we have our tools. I think the real challenge, and, and again, is Danny raised that, you know, we are, you know, when you are in a policy-making situation, you have to all the time you know, try to grab a model or, or, or grab a sort of a set of connections that you think is important to understand that particular problem, whether it's in you know, a, a debate on, on, uh, in an investment committee or whether it's a debate in, 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 in a, a, a board of, 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 a, of an IFI, for example. All the time you're, you're sort of trying to grab a model that sort of will convince others. And of course that's, you know, that's not always very satisfactory. So we, we need stronger criteria and, and I think uh, the what Daniel sort of outlined as, as this uh, method you're taking from growth diagnostics, I think, is one way of, of thinking about it. And, it, you know, it, it's a sort of a paradox, and, and, and we've seen this, that, you know, we have, particularly in development economics, this very, to my mind, very rich um, literature that comes out of uh, randomized control trials, but there's this tendency that maybe because we actually can do this experiment, we don't need models. I think that's completely flawed, and, and I think that uh, also the people who, re who do this really recognize you. Whatever experiment you are, you have to really have a mechanism. You need to have, you know, understand uh, what in, in case of what are the assumptions. And we, and, and I'm very much on the line that, that Danny has that, you know, assumptions we need to, to understand uh, not only, uh, you know, they, they are on their own can be criticized. And, and that's a very important when we select uh, among models that uh, do the assumptions make sense. Um, uh, and, so. and uh, one thing that didn't come out so much in, in Dana's presentation, which I think is, is much more important that we, than we actually maybe um, recognize uh, most of the time, which is that, you know, ultimately there are values when we, you select among uh, models, and we need to go back to those values and think about, you know, we have the responsibility, I think, for many years that we didn't really pay enough attention to distributional aspects in economics. We have this idea that we can compensate people af afterwards. All, all those things, you know, we need to think about that. You know, we, we don't really go back to sort of welfare economics uh, very much uh, these days. So that I think there are deep values that we need to try to, to make explicit also when we make these choices. I, I, so so um, before I, I end, I just want to take me back to, to sort of the, the time that I spent in this IFI to, to, to think about, you know, how can we use models and, uh, to, be, to have more impact? Because ultimately, I think that's what mo why most of us went into economics, because we, we thought we could contribute in, in some way. And um, so, so a few points that I just took down this morning to try to, to, to see, you know, what is it that I take away from that uh, experience of working in IFI? Well, you really need to be, as an economist, inside the core decision processes. So you cannot, if, if you have an ivory tower, it's never going to have that full impact. You need to get your hands dirty. You need to try to influence the architecture of these organizations so that economics is at the table and, and in both investment committees, in, in um, steering uh, groups and, and so on. Economics need to be part of shaping the mandate monitoring system. So. Uh, you need to, and, and this is, again, you have to make a lot of compromises because it's not perfect. It's, it's something that, uh, you know, you, you have to sometimes, uh, uh, you know, your models may be uh, overly simplistic sometimes. The same things, you, you need to build up data sets. I think that's my maybe number one experience is that data can be extremely powerful if you build them up and you integrate them into these uh, man mandate monitoring systems. Using experimental approaches to enhance learning and impact is incredibly important. One of the first things I did was to, to put uh, my whole, a whole part of the, the bank through a training in randomized control trials. It wasn't that I thought that they would actually do randomized control trials, but it's a way to, to think about how you implement uh, decisions and how you try to learn as much as possible. And, and you know, in a sense, every project that you implement is an experiment. You cannot always control very well, but still some of the fundamental features of it. Well, the last thing, and, and this is, I think, is, 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 is a very 
important thing is that, and, and many of you here have had this experience of working for different leaders. I worked for three different presidents, and it really matters enormously to what extent a particular president sort of is, is respectful, intimidated, or uh, insecure about economics, because you need to have a leader who sort of understands uh, the values and, 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 and what, what uh, economics can bring. I, I'll skip that. Um, so, um, so, more generally about policy experience, we need theories of change, we need models, every project must have one. This theories of change is sort of a, a cliche now in, in, in the development world, but I think it's actually very important and, and it's up to us econo economists to make this a, a, a real a tool. We need both general and partial equilibrium models. And, you know, we, I personally have worked mostly with partial equilibrium in my, in my academic work, but you know, one thing that we really have as an advantage, we can think in terms of complete systems, and, and that uh, is, I think, a very important uh, strength that we should use in organizations. We need to collect and interrogate data. We need to implement projects and policies in ways that maximize learnings. We need to simplify and reduce complexity. So we have to build narratives. If there's one thing that stands out to me, having worked in, 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 in an IFI, is these narratives are incredibly important. If we can shape these narratives, we can be part of and making these narratives evidence-based and, and, and uh, conceptually sound. That's the way we have an impact in, in these organizations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danny, and thank you very much, Eric. Danny, do you want to react now or as part of the... Yeah, okay. Um, listening to you, I couldn't help think about an, another Nobel Prize taken, Niels Bohr, who stresses in his work complementarity between different explanations and that we actually learn from all of them. So, I mean, even in physics, the same sort of discussion is going on. And I thought that was sort of at least one thought that came to my mind. Um, and on uh, Eric's comments, um, there is, of course, another Nobel Prize taker, Gunnar Muda, who stresses the importance of values and thinking about that so uh, I thought those two points at least came to my mind. We now have about 20 minutes for discussions, reactions, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start over here and, and ask for three questions, comments, and then I'll move over to the other side of the... Anybody wants to react? If nobody wants to grab the chance here, then I'll move okay here in the front. Thank you very much for your very interesting talks and presentations. I have one question regarding history. I'm wondering what kind of relevance you assign to history. And there I refer not only to the history of economic thought as a kind of pool of models, but economic and financial history. Because in the curricula, uh, economic um, and financial history is wiped out um, in order or, 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 or for, 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 for a better and uh, deeper quantitative capacity and sharpening our quantitative capacities. Now, I'm wondering whether uh, we lost a little bit this kind of um, capacity to se select the, the correct model because we, we are also losing this kind of qualitative uh, background and history. So I'm wondering what you would say to that and what you uh, could elaborate on that. Thank you very much. Okay, please pass the mic, just a couple of persons here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Danny, for this uh, very insightful talk. I had a, a question regarding the way we could discriminate among models. I was wondering whether we could not also quote the fact that it's possible to do some back testing, on macroeconomic models, you would not just make sure that a model replicates time series, because this is very easy once the model is complicated enough, but then, you know, to calibrate the model up to, let's say, 1970, then to check whether these models at this time would have said something relevant from 17 let's say, to 80, so back testing. And as you know, when you do this, most microeconomics models perform very badly. So this might be also a tool, I don't know, you think about it, you, you thought about it. And the second question is, I totally agree with you that we need a diversity of models, but, it, but nevertheless, there are models that are intrinsically wrong. Let me just give you an example. Creation of money. I mean, you know, the, the standard money multiplier, we know it's wrong. And if you talk to a banker, he will tell you, 
commission banks are creating money or creating credit every day. And in most diamond D big models, this is not the case. Well, we should also maybe sometimes say we have to give up this and this model for this reason. Okay, thank you. Okay, then I'll hand over to you, Danny, to react. Yeah, two, two great questions. I, I'm really happy you brought uh, up history, uh, and I, I do think that um, um, the, the, the downgrading of, of uh, economic history in the economics curriculum um, has been um, quite, uh, quite damaging, because I think, you know, from my perspective, <coughs> history pr is, provides a, 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 it's a laboratory of a very diverse experience, and um, I don't necessarily view qualitative and quantitative evidence uh, in tension. I, I think that uh, they both have a place, uh, but I think in the spirit of what you're saying, just because there is no particular quantitative evidence doesn't mean that we should not um, uh, use qualitative evidence or, or, or deep case studies or analytical cases. Or I think you know, history is extremely important to reinforce my message, which is that Things work very differently in different times and, and contexts. Uh, trade liberalization, to take you know, an area that I work in, trade liberalization worked very differently um, in the late 19th century than how, or really was protectionism in the late 19th century worked very differently than it did in the 60s and 70s. And I think we, um, you know, students who have not been exposed to the history of the earlier era of globalization and tariff history then. Um, get a completely misleading idea about what the relationship between trade policy and economic performance might be. Uh, so I think you know that's definitely, and I think uh, you know next time I do my slides, I, I definitely will in include history on the teaching uh, part. Um, I think the the questions about backtesting and and, and wrong as, uh, assumptions are absolutely essential. Um, I, I I do think that. Um, uh, we could do more. We could do more replication, and we could do more uh, sort of testing in the same context, but in a different time period. What we should avoid, however, is the view that what we're testing, whether that model is right, because you know the circumstances are going to change and contexts are going to be different. I think. Let me give you an example of how we actually go wrong. Um, in, in sort of the one area where there has been uh, explicit attempt to replicate RCTs has been with respect to the effect of microcredit. And there was an attempt to essentially run as close as possible the similar, the same microcredit experiment in a number of different countries. And it turned out, you won't be surprised, that the results were very, very different. Um, and uh, so what do we conclude from this? I think the, the authors tended to conclude, uh, unless I'm misreading, they concluded that microcredit doesn't work. Uh, because it produced so different results. My conclusion was very different, that, that actually there were some experiments, in some contexts it actually boosted consumption or investment, in some others it didn't. Uh, so that, how do you interpret that variation from the filter of my methodology? All that we're learning is that microcredit works differently in different places, and therefore the next step is not to jettison microcredit, but to actually run tests where you're focusing on the behavioral mechanisms to identify whether, in fact, it has, it has, it has to do with particular uh, behavioral mechanisms or, or preconditions or not. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that's, that's the issue. Um, with respect to the, to the wrong assumptions, again, you know, the, you're absolutely right, and I say this in the book, all models are wrong. All models are wrong because they are just, you know, simplifications and abstractions, and therefore they're totally wrong. The question is whether they're useful. Um, and, and they are useful if the critical assumptions and the behavioral relationships have been selected appropriately. So where I think the you know, model doesn't belong is where a particular critical assumption fails. So there are many assumptions that we make that are not critical. So you know, to, 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 to ensure that a, down, a demand curve is downward sloping, we don't need to make the assumption of a representative agent. It will be, you know, that will hold under much broader Set. We don't necessarily even need to assume optimizing behavior on the part of consumers. That will hold under a much broader. But it's convenient to assume a, a, a single representative agent in the micro foundations of that model, unless that assumption then 
ensures that we're getting a result that would be different if we in incorporated heterogeneity. So it's when it does the assumption of representative agent becomes critical when it actually interacts with the behavioral uh, relationships in a way that produces another result uh, that's contrary to the one that we get with. So it's not whether an assumption is wrong or not, it's whether your critical assumption is wrong, and I think that we could be certainly paying much more attention to. Eric, you want to add anything? Okay. Any further here on this side? Okay, then we move over here. So we'll start here and then go next, yeah, and then down there. So we start here, here, here. My name is Marcus Miller, and I have a question about macroeconomics. Uh, you said that uh, finding a new model does not mean you have to throw away the old one. But you didn't cite the words of Robert Lucas, who says the opposite. He said that with the development of real business cycle theory and DSGE, you should indeed throw away Keynesian economics. And he described how people giggle in seminars if you refer to Keynesian ideas, how you can't get your work published if you use Keynesian ideas, and you can't get a job unless you know all about DSGE. So it seems as if, at least in macroeconomics, there are dominant paradigms that grow up. So my question for you, Danny, is um, why do these paradigms arise? What is your model of the paradigm? And how do you escape from them? <laughs> okay, Tim? So, <clears throat> my question is actually rather related to Marcus's. I, I'm full of optimism when I think of hear your presentation as plurality of ideas, but if I was then to comb through the graduate curricula of different schools, I would not be overwhelmed by the diversity. I'd be overwhelmed by the narrowness of the, what is taught to graduate students, and maybe even further at, at the undergraduate level. I, mean, I think Eric touched on the example of not teaching welfare economics. I mean, that used to be a staple of the curriculum, but the average graduate student now has had that fully marginalized, I think, to a great cost of uh, the economics profession since the core of almost all economic policy advice is some kind of welfare economic, mo welfare economic model which goes entirely unacknowledged in many uh, discussions. So I guess it's the, the paradox is, well, we've got so much plurality, we've got so much diversity, why so much homogeneity in actually what we teach? And there was one in the fourth row. Yeah, okay, you have the mic. So, yeah, so my question is that in, in, your, in your model of how to use models in economics, it's a very deductive approach where you have competing different models and then you try to, you know, use them to, to, to test one of them and see which one is correct and then in a particular setting and then you use that pre-selected model to interpret your data. Um, but I guess what sometimes happens in economics, especially in economic research, is that people may run their randomized control trial People may run their regression analysis, they get some common sense intuitions about what the regression coefficients mean, and then they sort of retrofit a mathematical model to explain their intuitions. And in that setting, the mathematical model doesn't really add very much in terms of helping you interpret the results, because you already had your common sense intuitions. So in that case, do you then support people maybe pre-registering their mathematical models before they do the analysis? Okay, Danny? Oh, great, great questions. Um, uh, yeah, let me start from the last one. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a great believer in combining the deductive and the inductive method. And I, I don't think there is anything wrong uh, with um, uh, fitting a model after the fact. And, and it's not counterproductive because what the model after the fact does is say here is a plausible configuration of features that is going to produce this outcome. What it does is, as you're right, you should never evaluate the model <laughs> on the basis of the evidence that motivated it. However, the model then provides a reason for others then to take that model and use the incidental implications of that model in other settings to say whether in fact you know, that model is necessarily has, might have some, some broader validity. So even when that doesn't happen because contexts are very different, um, you know, there are 
other um, uh, standards by which you can judge the usefulness of that after the fact model independently of the data that you've used. And I've, I've mentioned that, for example, the, 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 the realism of the critical assumptions that goes into that models, the realism of the behavioral channels that have been built into that and whether you observe them in other settings and so forth. Um, so, um, so I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't want to pre-register those and I think they, they, they do provide stories out of the fact that are very helpful and that might actually go beyond to other settings as well. So I think that's, and I do think that some of the best economics is done in that inductive deductive mode. That's another way that I think our philosophy of science is wrong. We have this very deductive model. We develop a theory, we, te we test it, you know, we accept it if it passes and we reject it if it doesn't. That's not how the best economics goes. It's just always an interchange between sort of the empirics and then, you know, development of, of, of stories after the fact. And that's absolutely fine. Now, I, both Marcus and, and Tim, uh, you know, sort of suggest in, in sort of, in, you know, gently that maybe I'm, I'm too optimistic and that there are some deeper problems in, in the profession. Um, now, I think macro is clearly where and I talk about this in, 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 in the book, and I do talk about the failure precisely of having focused on the model, on the, on the RBC uh, uh, model in macro. And, and we learned this the hard way when the financial crisis came. Now, there was a reason that the, you know, the RBC models were developed, because the Keynesian model didn't work very well in the 1970s when the sh supply shocks were on the supply side. So the development of some of the key features on that, rational expectations, um, the um, uh, you know sort of you know uh, you know long, long term horizons um, uh, those were very critical things that we don't want to jettison uh, but you know I think I think the the, the 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 way in which the manner in which the profession moved which was to say that we now have the right model uh, you know proved very wrong and in a way so so my comment my my the book and the presentation was really to say, as I said at the outset, this p results in part because the profession has the wrong philosophy of science. And, and this is ex worse in macroeconomics that, that we should be always moving towards the right model. The fact is, as you ver know very well, you know, the Keynesian model and various iterations, modern day ver variants, are going to be applicable in some settings and they're not going to be applicable in other settings. And I think the, the, you know, we would be doing so much better if we were to teach students what are the settings under which the Keynesian model is relevant, what are the settings in which it is not going to be relevant. Um, and, and, I, and, and the same mistake, I fear, is sort of being you know, replicated in macro because now there is, again, you know, everything I read about macro is increasingly about let's find the right hybrid model, let's find a new model, instead of you know, having a multiplicity. And I think, you know, with regard to, to Tim, I, I think, you know, I, I'm, I did not know that. I'm very disappointed to hear that welfare economics is not taught in public economics courses. I think it's probably a lot to do with, with the empirical turn that I think we now teach, you know, everything about labor supply, elasticities, and things like that, but not in a lot, you know, about welfare economics. And I think that's, that's clearly wrong. I mean, I think that's a reflect, that's, that's, that's a result of the fact that um, research fads spill over into how we teach. So I see that, for example, in trade. So let me give you the trade version of that. So if we teach international trade today, you know, it's going to be all about heterogeneous firms. Um, and maybe you'll do a, a week about standard Ricardian model, and then you'll go into all these models of you know, heterogeneous firms. Um, that's where the research frontier is. So normally people are just teaching where the research frontier is. But if you just take a step back and say, you know, how much of, you know, in terms of understanding the world economy, you know, what, you know, how many of the sort of basic Ricardian intu intuitions you want to have as opposed to intuitions from this uh, sort of new, new, new strain, you know, the new strain is adding something, but let's not downgrade what's already there. Um, so we can do, uh, you know, much better clearly, uh, clearly in that. But I will take refuge um, in my defense to say that this is much more about the sociology of the profession, and therefore I don't have a very good model of that. Okay, Eric, you had a comment? Yes, um, two comments again from a policy making perspective. So, to the question of you know, retrofitting uh, models, uh, I, you know, in policy making you all the time have to work on both things, and, you, and I think it's very dangerous actually to, to move into a, a sort of policy situation 
with a very fixed model in your mind. So, so some elements of induction is always important. And, and, and actually, I think one, and, and I think that's the essence of what Dan is saying, is that you know a criteria when you select a model, even if it's retrofitted, you know, is how fruitful will it be for other settings? You know, so when I look at a model, and, and, and I would say. Does it apply to other contexts? You know, is it rich in implications that we can test in, in other ways? And so, so I think that's an important criterion in, in selection of, of a model. On, on this issue of um, the narrowness of, of, of um, curricula, so, so um, and, and, and actually Tim and I had a conversation about this yesterday. But, but uh, you know, when when I studied economics in, in, in graduate school, the cost-benefit analysis was, was out, and and you know, a lot was thrown out with that baby, I think, and, and a lot of these uh, questions around welfare economics was, was, was kind of rejected or, or, or dismissed. In practice, in, in policy making, you cost-benefit analysis is what everyone, that's how people think, and, and you need somehow to get into that and, and, and try to apply uh, some sort of thinking around, you know, who, who's from whose perspective are you looking at this problem? Uh, you know, what are the, you know, what are the implications for different uh, parts of society or this particular? Part? So, I think we. It's true that you know, in benefit cost-benefit analysis, we were simplifying tremendously, and and I think we learn now that we have to be very careful. But we maybe lost something in that process, thinking through those those issues. Any any last reactions? No. Okay. Thank you very much, Danny. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for great questions.